<clears throat> for those of you who don't know, I've uh, followed Neil Thompson's work very, very closely for years. And uh, when I was researching for this session, Neil, uh, I had a whole bunch of questions already, right? Uh, but I decided I wanted to do something a little different because Neil isn't someone you bump into every day. So I drafted my questions like a good student and I fed them into a couple of AI uh, models and I asked the AI models, uh, do you agree with these questions? Should I ask these questions to Neil? Uh, and I was very surprised by the reply, honestly, because uh, all of the models that I asked that question to said, uh, Sure, Shiv, these are nice questions, these are good <laughs> questions, but how about you also ask these questions? Uh, so, think of me today not as an NDTV anchor or uh, Shiv Arur, but as a sort of messenger for the machines. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm going to be asking many of the questions that AI wants me to ask Neil Thompson, and some of these are mine, and I won't tell you which is which, so you'll have to distinguish, but mm. I want to start, before I go to that, to something that you mentioned in your presentation, Neil. Uh, you gave those two very uh, serious examples of chaos. Uh, you know, uh, uh, a navigation app driving someone off a bridge, uh, a deep fake uh, affecting someone's life. Uh, those are things we've reported here on NDTV. And, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, myself, many of my colleagues here who are on camera, we've all been victims of deep fakes where, uh, you know, random products are advertised with our faces. Uh, and we've been in trouble because of that. So I want to ask you in your line of work, paint us a picture of a nightmare scenario of how bad things could be in terms of what AI can do. These two examples you've taken, uh, you know, the, the mind kind of understands them. They can happen. Are there extreme scenarios that you think about? So when I think about this question, I think often about this question of empowerment, right? So one of the things about AI, as has been true for a lot of IT tools in general, is that they empower people to do more things. And the problem is, of course, when people are empowered in that way, Sometimes they'll use it for good and sometimes they'll use it for bad, right? And so when I think of the sort of bad scenarios that can come here, imagine that you're a business and you have, you know, even just one client who's really dissatisfied, but they can then go home and flood every place where your business is rated with bad reviews. Imagine that you're in a situation where you, you come in and suddenly, like, your email servers are flooded with all kinds of things that seem to be maybe real, maybe not real, and it becomes harder for you to distinguish these things. As tools get more powerful, this idea of harnessing what computers can do in a huge number of ways becomes a real challenge. Again, something that you touched upon, and then I'll go to the questions from the machines, uh, Neil. What should, uh, what should give us comfort about AI, because AI uh, is, is a part of everyone's life. When I did that show of hands, you know, maybe 10 hands went up, but I know that knowingly or unknowingly, everyone here uses AI, right? Yeah. It's part of our life. It's sliced bread now. Uh, what should give us comfort and what should trouble us about where AI stands right now? Yeah, so let me, let me give you sort of two, two sources of comfort here, right? So one of the sources of comfort is just that we are going to become more productive from this, right? That it's like one of the things that society always struggles with is when there's some kind of disruption, right? If the pie is not getting bigger that we're sharing, that can be a challenge. AI should make the pie bigger, right? And that means that we can make decisions as societies that are humane, that make sure that people are protected. Now, we have to make good choices to, to go down that road, but we can. The other thing to think about is if you're thinking about your particular job or some tasks in your job and you're worried about them getting automated, it's really important to understand that there's a separation between how the capabilities are developing. So if you think about you know, what OpenAI has within their own walls and how fast those things get developed. Because there's this thing that we call AI last mile costs. So people may be familiar with this idea from telecommunications, right? It's very cheap to get broadband or something to your, to like within a mile of your house. And it's very expensive to get it in that last bit because you have to go to each person individually. There's an analogy here with AI. It's very easy 
comparatively, to build these really powerful systems. But if you then say, well, for your particular business, for your particular business, what are all the customizations you need to do? What's all the data you need to curate? All that infrastructure you need to build? All of those things are last mile costs. And it's going to take quite a while for society to build up those last mile costs those last mile connections. And so for many people, there's going to be this very long tail of jobs that will be protected for quite a long time. And that will ease the transition a little that, bit. That definitely is a comfort because I can tell you that in the media here in India, there's always a survey every week about <laughs> Uh, you know, the number of job losses that are going to happen as a result of AI. And those are the stories that do really well because they instantly, uh, you know, scare everyone. Absolutely. Uh, so now, question from the machine number one, mm -hmm. Neil, which is that, you know, AI breakthroughs, and again, some of your work deals with this, uh, you know, might hit a wall of diminishing returns because of computing power, because of GPUs, but there are models now that suggest that the ceiling could possibly be broken. Is it possible that the bottleneck isn't hardware at all, in your view, but human imagination? Are we underestimating how far clever algorithmic hacks can go before physics really hits back? Yeah, so this is, this is a great question, and it's one where... Um, you know, when we first started thinking about this question, probably uh, about seven years ago now, um, we looked at it and we said, well, th we think there'll be an analogy to wh what has happened with the rest of computer chips, right? If you look at all of the other stuff we run, all these semiconductors we were just hearing about from the minister, the overwhelming source of improvement we've gotten for them is miniaturization. We make these parts smaller. That means you can put more on a chip. You can run them faster. That means we have more and more powerful computers that, that we're able to harness. And so that has been sort of a, a very promising thing we ha we've had. And we said, okay, the problem is that path for semiconductors is limited. There's just not that much left in it. What is that going to mean for uh, AI? And but what, I, what I showed you today is that Actually, now that we have, and, and my lab has led uh, many of these things, now that we've actually tried to measure all of these different co components coming in, actually that chips part has not been the most important. The most important has been one, scaling up. That's not great for the environment because you're using a lot of power and a lot of chips, but it's okay. But the second one is this algorithm improvement. That has actually been more important. Yeah. And so, you know, if I come back to my old self, I would say, you know, you underestimated the algorithmic improvement that could happen. Now, it is important to say that we don't know how long it will continue, yeah. right? So I told you that algorithmic improvement is this idea of making things more efficient. For all algorithms, there is some optimum. There's some sort of better thing you can do. And when we've looked at traditional algorithms in computers, we find that many, many algorithms are already at, as good as they can possibly be. We can imagine that we might have an analogy for AI algorithms, but we don't see evidence of it yet. So this next question, Neil, is a question where the AI model struck out one of the questions that I had and said, no, Shiv, ask this question. <laughs> so here that question is. It said, uh, you know, a lot of work being done right now is about how humans don't so much lose control to AI as willingly hand it over to recommendation systems, like I did with these questions, right? <laughs> Self-driving cars, even military drones. So the question is, if the results are consistently better when we relinquish control faster, safer, are we wrong to resist that handover? Is the problem really loss of control or loss of human ego? So I, th I think it really matters sort of what you're talking about yeah. here, right? So if, you know, I recommend to uh, business people all the time this idea that, and actually to my students as well, you know, using these systems as like an idea generation system is fantastic. You say, you know, give me 20 ideas for this particular thing. You look through them and you say, ah, you know, number three and number seven seem really promising. I'm going to continue exploring that. I think that's a great use of AI that, that, that helps us do it. Similarly, I think, um, you know, for self-driving cars, I think we will get to some moment where all of a sudden they are safer on the road. And I think it will be really good for society to do that. So I think in many of these cases, we, sh we should do this. But we should remember what I talked about in my, in my session before, that there are these errors that come in, right? And those errors can be exploited. Those errors can create unexpected harms. That we need to keep those in mind because... If we think about AI and just put it in that box of traditional IT, we're going to think like, oh, it's got 100% accurate, and it isn't. 
and those can have very serious consequences. Uh, you know, Neil, the, the idea of self-driving cars is so appealing to all of us here in India. Believe me, <laughs> uh, and especially in festive season, uh, everyone wants a self-driving car. Now, until a few months ago, maybe a year ago, uh, it was a faraway castle to most people, even in the United States. But now I understand, uh, and as Nitin Mittal was mentioning yesterday as well with companies like Waymo and others, uh, it's, it's becoming pretty normal for, for people to take, uh, uh, you know, driverless cars. Uh, so I wanted to use that example uh, uh, to ask you that next question, and this is a human question from me, which is that uh, that skepticism keeps getting eroded the more we use it, doesn't it, uh, for something like a self-driven car, uh, and this can be analogous to many other uses of AI as well. You know, we don't think it's going to work, then we use it a couple of times, it works brilliantly, and then we can't remember never believing in it. Uh, absolutely. And, and hopefully, uh, some of the data that I showed today sort of explains why, right? We saw that this frontier was moving out, and you very quickly can go from a situation where it just cannot complete the task at all when you look at it, right? I think we probably all had this experience. You put something into ChatGPT and it gets back an answer, and you're like, man, this, this is just terrible. This is not even close, right? And then you come back 12 months later, and you're like, oh my goodness, this answer is quite good. So I absolutely think that's the case. I think you know, again, for humans, in, I think the autonomous yeah. vehicles is a really informative case. We do often, like, we say, ah, I saw four examples of it doing really well, and I handed over control. And I think that actually is a problem, because when we think about how capable these systems are, we tend to analogize from the way that we learn, right? And so we say, like, if, if you show me that you can do well here, you can do well here, and you can do well here, yeah. I assume that everywhere in that space between it, you're also going to do well. That is not the case with AI systems, right? These are, these are systems that are trained on particular examples. If there is something that is away from what they've been trained on, they can get very far off track, right? And so it's actually considerably harder to test it than we might imagine because they don't learn the same way and so our intuition doesn't carry over very well. Uh, uh, Neil, I'm, uh, you don't know this about me, but I'm uh, also a defense reporter. I cover uh, uh, war and conflict and so I had to squeeze this question in and this is one of my own. Uh, you know, the defense dilemma. You know, when we talk about AI, we have to talk about drones. Uh, India and Pakistan just went to uh, a sort of semi-war where they use drones against each other for the first time. Uh, now, we've seen it happen in, uh, uh, in Ukraine in a big way. You know, every side claims their systems are still, you know, human in the loop. But we know, you know, that the, this loop, this combat loop is shrinking by the day. So my question to you is if machines can make faster tactical combat calls uh, that save human lives or, or take human lives more efficiently without collateral damage. Do you think moral hesitation itself becomes unethical? And w at what point does restraint become liability? Okay, well, the, all of the eth ethical implications, I'm going to let you bring a philosophy professor up for, for the full version of that. But I definitely think that we, we are running into this problem, right? And this problem is that when you have a competitive system where you have you know, two sides in a war or you have two competitors in a market, right, they're going to start racing, right? And that's going to lead to people wanting to escalate capabilities. And of course, one of the things you can do if that human in the loop is slow is you can relinquish capabilities. And that can create just you know, real challenges, real risks that come into these things. And so I think it's, it's very important for us to think about you know, is there a way to control it? And so, you know, one of the questions my, my lab has sort of been trying to ask, and, you know, I say, as I mentioned in my talk, we don't know the answer yet, yeah. but we would really like to find a, a path to develop AI where as we gain capabilities, we also gain control, right? And, and the hope is that if you can find that, that will also be efficient. And, and if that's true, then that means that as people race, systems will become more controllable and, more, and safer, we don't know that that's true, yeah. and we don't even know that where that path is yet. And so we can hope that we can avoid some of these situations, but I think that racing is going to happen, and you know, I'm quite worried about where it's going to go. As we come to a close, uh, Neil, uh, you know, a personal reflection, and this again is a question from the machines, interestingly enough. If you could freeze AI development for a whole year and ask humanity to think hard about maybe one question before resuming uh, AI, what question would that be? And I remind you, this is a question the machine is asking you. <laughs> yeah, so it really would be about this, how do, we, how do we have controllability of these systems? That it's just, it's, you know, you can tell these systems, you know, people may know you put in a prompt and you say like, hey, I want you to solve the problem this way, absolutely don't do this, absolutely don't do that. 
sometimes it will follow your instructions and sometimes it won't, right? And that means that if you say, I want a system that is not going to have bias, if I want a system that is not going to, you know, treat people in a certain way, is not going to, like, use some resources that it's not supposed to, like, we don't know that it won't do that, those things. That idea of how do I build up a system of control that will do it, I think would just be incredibly valuable and would give us so much more confidence as we build these systems that we're not growing the amount of risk we're doing as we gain the as we grow the amount of benefits we're getting. So my final question then will be my own once again, which is, uh, you know, we had the minister on stage just now and he was talking about how, uh, you know, Indian AI model will be coming and there's a lot of things for India to do. Uh, there are so many problems for India to solve uh, using AI. What role do you see globally for India as far as AI is concerned? Uh, you know, in India has been a software and an IT, uh, you know, giant and a power house, uh, but there is a sense that India uh, doesn't have an open AI just yet, despite having the, you know, the, the brain power perhaps to have built something of that kind. What path do you see and what role do you see for India in the path ahead for global AI? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, if algorithmic progress really is this sort of path that we're going to be down, I think that means that, you know, the fact that you don't have an open AI doesn't mean you can't have models that are, you know, pretty, pretty close to the frontier. And then I think you get to leverage all of the other benefits that India has, right? As we build agentic systems that are going to be using tools, the incredible expertise that the country has in these systems and building and that interconnection will be incredibly valuable. The kind of data and situations you have here where you can pull it in and solve different kinds of problems, I think all of that will be a great benefit. Because Sam Altman on one occasion famously said uh, India can't build an open AI. And he had his reasons for that, but then he had to backtrack a little bit. Yeah, I, I do not know what those reasons would be, but I, I think, you know, I can imagine lots of promise. You've given us uh, an incredible amount to think about, and I know the machines are listening already, so I don't have to relay your answers to them. But thank you very much for shining the light, doing this uh, frontier research uh, on behalf of humanity, and that is not a, a sentimental thing to say, because the work you do truly is letting us know what the next steps are going to be in something uh, that is becoming increasingly a part of our daily life and that we soon probably won't be able to live without. Neil Thompson, a very warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Yeah. Stay for a moment on stage. We've got a memento for you. Thompson, oh, Neil, before we uh, go yeah. away just yet, uh, we have a couple of questions for you as well. Okay. Did you look AI up before getting to India to understand which would be the best meal to have? Indian meal? Uh, I did not. And what have you been eating? Have you liked any of the cuisines that you've been yeah. offered? Indian food. Uh, yeah, yes. Well, so I, the la last night in particular, so I, I have to tell you, when I was uh, younger, Indian was one of my favorite cuisines. And then unfortunately, about 10 years ago, I developed some allergies. And so a bunch of the, the meals I couldn't have anymore. And so it was an absolute delight last night at the dinner to have the chef, who was aware of my allergies, prepare a whole bunch of things specifically for that I was able to eat. So I got to enjoy it once again after such a long time. Fantastic. Professor I Thompson, I'm going to ask a trillion dollar question, like the valuation of a lot of AI companies. <laughs> when you were braving Ve Delhi's traffic and weather, like she was saying, autonomous cars, do you think you'd have used AI to get through? Well, so I have to say, uh, you know, I, at MIT, we get to see a lot of what's going on in the self-driving cars. And what, what, you know, what, what we've been told, and I think this is, you know, evolving, but it was like for common situations, driving on the highway with clear lines, system's incredibly good. As you get to more unusual situations, it becomes a little more iffy. I saw a lot of unusual situations on the way from the airport. So I, I think I'm going to trust the human for a little while longer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Thompson, a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank Shane. you.